So in the next 40 minutes, I would like to discuss about gallium magnesium arsenide, a uh, ferromagnetic semiconductor. Uh, we, I would like to share with you uh, the fun that we are having uh, by uh, creating a new, synthesizing a new material and uh, understanding it and using it to explore a new, dimensions of, uh, a new dimension of magnetism. So that's basically the outline of my uh, tutorial today. Okay, so um, very beginning we wanted to make, let's say, gallium arsenide uh, magnetic. Gallium arsenide, as you know, uh, we can make transistors, high-speed transistors, we can make lasers out of it. So uh, we wanted to make it uh, magnetic uh, and combine it with uh, uh, transistor structures and hopefully laser structure, LED structures. Uh, another reason why we wanted to make uh, gallium, uh, we wanted to use gallium arsenide is that we know how to process it so that we can uh, make, uh, if we can make gallium arsenide magnetic, uh, we can make device-like structures uh, out of it. So um, the choice uh, was to uh, put some manganese into the system, uh, uh, partially replacing uh, gallium. So this is, you can call it doping, but we wanted to make this doping as high as possible to see the effect, uh, or, 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 or magnetic effect. So we wanted to go beyond the solubility limit. Well, parenthetically, our manganese has only two uh, S electrons, and we replace uh, man, uh, gallium with manganese, so uh, there's missing one electron, uh, valence electron, so manganese not only introduces uh, 5D electrons, but also it introduces a hole, uh, a conduction carrier. So um, first of all, we, need to, we needed to synthesize the material, and the method we used was uh, low temperature molecular beam epitaxy. Uh, we were lucky to find out fi uh, that uh, there's a, a window, temperature window, this is 250 degrees C. Uh, uh, usually for gallium arsenide, we use 600 degrees C to grow the material. But we, we reduce the uh, growth temperature to maintain the potential landscape uh, on which manganese uh, can find its, uh, its, uh, its site, which is gallium site. And the temperature is not low enough so that we do not have uh, polycrystalline growth. So in a if you choose 170 degrees C, we, 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 we get this polycrystalline growth. And if uh, the substrate temperature is too high, then we, find, uh, we found out that manganese arsenide grows. A manganese arsenide is a stable form uh, uh, between manganese and arsenic. So in between 300 and 170, we can grow uh, very, very nicely uh, gallium magnesium arsenide epitaxial layer. So that was, uh, that was the beginning of the whole story. Uh, also, we, we, we needed to know where actually our manganese uh, sit in the crystal. So this we used, uh, not we, uh, they used uh, we, meaning com the community, wanted to understand where, where our manganese is. So we used uh, extended X-ray absorption fine structure to probe where manganese is in, in the crystal. So, uh, and we compared uh, the result of experiment with the theory, the theoretical curves, and showed uh, that uh, indeed uh, uh, manganese with 7.4% or 0.5% uh, manganese sits and sees uh, four nearest arsenic, 12 nearest gallium, uh, second nearest gallium, uh, 12 arsenic, uh, third nearest arsenic. Uh, in the way, uh, uh, in, in, according to the simulation, uh, in the way, uh, very, very close to the simulation uh, in which manganese is assumed to be uh, at the gallium uh, site. So uh, most of the manganese uh, substitute uh, group three cation site, in our case, uh, gallium site. And that's the reason why we're, 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 I'm writing this uh, alloy or compound as uh, gallium with manganese in parenthesis uh, with arsenic. 
We also wanted to know, uh, but it took us a uh, rather long time, wh whether uh, manganese in gallium arsenide uh, is distributed randomly or not. And very recently, this is 2009 work, uh, we used atom probe microscopy to probe the distribution of manganese in a, in a rather small uh, length scale, which is about uh, 10 nanometer or so. Uh, this is manganese distribution, this is gallium distribution, and this is arsenic distribution. For those of you who do not know what atom probe uh, microscop microscopy is, it's, it's basically you make a very thin tip of, of gallium manganese arsenide in this case and apply a very high voltage. And, uh, but the, the high voltage, uh, you apply a high voltage in such a way that only when uh, laser light shines the surface of gallium manganese arsenide, you get uh, atoms coming out from this, this very thin tip. And you, when you analyze it, the, the atoms coming out from the tip, uh, you can uh, generate uh, the thickness dependence of the atom distribution. And according to this, uh, we, we, as far as uh, this experiment goes, uh, uh, the ra uh, manganese uh, are distributed randomly in the system, not uh, uh, within this experimental error that is given by the experiment. So we can safely assume that our manganese is randomly distributed in, uh, on our gallium site, uh, at least for the first approximation. Then we measured uh, magnetization. We wanted to uh, see if uh, we can make, uh, we, can, we have successfully made gallium arsenide magnetic. And indeed, uh, we have seen uh, not only paramagnetic behavior, but ferromagnetic order uh, taking place in uh, gallium manganese arsenide, gallium arsenide alloyed with manganese. For example, in this case, as you can see, uh, there's nice saturation. We also, uh, also, the saturation field depends on the direction of magnetization or direction of the magnetic field you apply with respect to the, the, the crystalline orientation. So we have easy axis. Uh, in our case, uh, in this particular case, it's uh, one bar, one zero. And the hard axis is zero, zero, one perpendicular axis. Um, Okay, and, uh, and uh, from the temperature dependence of this uh, remanent magnetization, we see that our transition temperature is somewhere around 110 Kelvin in this case. The highest uh, transition temperature so far is about uh, 190. I will come back to this later. Uh, we also noted, noticed that uh, we have a built-in magnetometer, so we do not need to measure or magnetization by using, for example, squid magnetometer. Uh, this is because uh, the whole voltage, uh, the blue curve here is whole voltage, so it's a voltage uh, divided by the current we flow, uh, so we call uh, this whole resistance. Uh, so whole resistance uh, or whole voltage developed across this whole, uh, whole probes uh, closely follow these uh, red dots, which is uh, measurement, which is uh, the result of measurement of magnetization. And this is because the second term, an almost whole uh, term, is entirely dominating uh, the whole voltage in the temperature range that we are looking at, in the magnetic field range that we are looking at. So it's nice that we do not need to uh, grow a rather big, uh, large area material uh, to do direct measurements. We only have to have a whole bar uh, to measure the, the magnetization uh, of the material. Okay, um, oh, this is just to explain what we are seeing. So, so this is the anomalous uh, hole effect. Uh, we have three different hole effects. Uh, and one is ordinary hole effect. We, we all know that, uh, that by applying magnetic field, there's a Lorentz force acting on electrons and we get hole effect, hole voltage. We also know uh, that um, uh, the David, is in, David Arsham is, in, is attending this conference. Uh, he has seen, uh, imaged this effect, a spin hole effect. 
which was very difficult to measure because uh, there was no voltage developed uh, across. Uh, but uh, the anomalous Hall effect is, uh, is there uh, with uh, finite magnetization, with spin polarization, and you can all, uh, detect the spin uh, scattering by, uh, by measuring voltage. So that's the reason why we have very closely uh, been able to monitor uh, magnetization by whole voltage. Well, uh, of course, uh, we want to also know the carrier concentration. But, uh, and usually we, in semiconductor physics, we use the whole effect to measure carrier concentration. But as I said, it was, uh, the, the whole effect was entirely dominated by uh, the anomalous whole effect. So what do you do? Uh, there are other methods, which I will uh, briefly describe, but uh, you can go to low temperature, a high magnetic field, in this case uh, above 25 Tesla, and uh, at this high magnetic field with, uh, with low temperature, we can saturate uh, this term here. Magnetization is saturated uh, at, at low temperature and high field, and also uh, this anomalous hole coefficient, which has a uh, resistivity component in it, uh, can be also saturated at, uh, at low temperature and going to high magnetic field. Then the remaining slope can be measured uh, at high, uh, because this, is, this, is, this, this part becomes constant. And the remaining part, which is the ordinary hole effect, is shown here. And from this, we have determined that in, in this particular sample, we have uh, 3.5 times into 20 S carriers, and the conduction type is P-type. So we have holes, in accordance with the fact that manganese in gallium arsenide is uh, an acceptor. Uh, this particular material has 5.3% manganese, and we get uh, 3.5 times into 20 S per cubic centimeter holes. And the numbers don't m match. If we assume that we have a very simple acceptor in gallium arsenide, uh, we should expect a 5.3% equivalent number of holes. But that's a uh, uh, three times more than this number. So uh, we only see 30% uh, of uh, uh, activity in terms of uh, acceptor uh, activation. So that's uh, uh, that was a question uh, we had uh, at the very early stage of uh, understanding the material. The answer uh, came from uh, many directions, but the first hint came from uh, low temperature annealing. Uh, we have grown uh, low temp uh, using low temperature MBE to grow, uh, uh, we, uh, using low temperature MBE uh, to grow gallium manganese arsenide. Uh, but after growth, uh, at you, you anneal at the very same temperature uh, outside the chamber, again, uh, the scaling magnets arsenide. And the uh, University of Tokyo group first noticed that you can actually uh, reduce the resistance or in increase the conductance of the material. And at the same time, you increase the transition temperature. So there's something going on uh, in the material after uh, growth. And uh, people haven't done this uh, uh, before because many people believe that annealing at the same temperature as, as, uh, as a growth temperature uh, doesn't do anything on the material. But uh, it, was not uh, it, was, it wasn't correct. And the reason for this uh, this increase in conduct conductivity or decrease in resistivity is, uh, is because we have manganese interstitial in the system, as well as uh, manganese in a substitutional site. And this has been proved by uh, Rutherford backscattering spectroscopy uh, uh, combined with uh, particle-induced X-ray uh, emission pixie, how many people call it. And uh, by this channeling experiment, well, uh, at doing channeling experiment and at the same time doing uh, this particle-induced x-ray 
emission, we can tell that uh, manganese is sitting at the interstitial uh, position. And this manganese uh, is highly mobile, and uh, when oxidized uh, at the surface, uh, the uh, manganese concentration, the bare manganese concentration at the surface is reduced. So there's always uh, a diffusion uh, going on from bulk gallium manganese arsenide towards surface. So that's the reason why we have seen a very large uh, annealing effect at low temperature. So uh, this is a summary slide, uh, which I will uh, just go through uh, with you. Um, first of all, uh, manganese in gallium site is an acceptor. Uh, manganese in interstitial site uh, does not have any bonding, which means it has two uh, S electrons, which can, which can be donated to the conduction band of gallium arsenide. And, 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 and as such, manganese interstitial is a double donor. And uh, the, the total manganese concentration in the sample is divided into uh, manganese sitting in the gallium site and manganese sitting in the interstitial site. And uh, the whole concentration is given by this uh, equation because uh, interstitial is a double donor, so it, it, it emits two electrons to, and it can kill two holes, uh, which means that our whole concentration is a it's not only the, the difference between the two, but uh, this difference uh, between this two times manganese interstitial. In addition, uh, there is an a antiferromagnetic coupling between manganese uh, in gallium site and manganese interstitial. And this, is, uh, 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 this gives you a lower potential energy. So most of manganese interstitial tends to form an antiferromagnetic coupling between manganese uh, in, in gallium site. And, and because this is antiferromagnetic coupling, by measuring uh, magnetization, we do not see those uh, coupled uh, gallium, uh, coupled uh, manganeses. So that means that our effective concentration is equal to uh, manganese in gallium site minus manganese in, in interstitial site. Well, in terms of, well, this is a concentration that you see uh, by uh, doing mag uh, magnetization measurements. So there's a, a lot of uh, compensation in different ways uh, going on in the system. And the slide here uh, on the left-hand panel is a slide that uh, we, well, these authors compared uh, this number determined independently from uh, the whole concentration so these, this, this, this is basically this number. They independently determined these two numbers and plotted here, and they showed that indeed the measured hole concentration uh, is, is closely followed by, by this equation, which means that uh, the picture shown here is, uh, at, at least uh, this equation here is, is correct. Okay. So now uh, we know how many manganese we are, we are having in, in, in our system. Uh, how many holes we have in the system, how uh, things are compensated in the system. So we can uh, now develop a, a, a model for the ferromagnetism we see in the system, which was actually done uh, with uh, Professor Dito, who is in the audience. Uh, so this is our, our model. Uh, we have two uh, spin systems. One is manganese spins. Basically, these are manganese D electrons. And these are uh, carrier hole uh, spins. And we as assume here that we have an in exchange interaction between these uh, P electrons and D electrons. So we call it a PD exchange, which, is, which will be the subject of uh, Professor Dito's uh, uh, lectures this afternoon. So uh, if there is an exchange interaction, if you in introduce a, uh, a magnetization, finite magnetization in this system, you increase your free energy because you, you have introduced order in the system. But because of this exchange interaction, 
you get the spin splitting, and you always reduce uh, the carrier energy here. And this uh, free energy uh, increase uh, can be reduced by reducing temperature. And that means that at some temperatures, this uh, energy increase and energy uh, gain balances, which is uh, the transition temperature uh, given here. So our transition temperature can be calculated if you know this exchange constant, and also the, uh, if you know the band structure, uh, and if you assume the carrier concentration, we know where EF is, the Fermi energy is, and we can uh, calculate uh, the transition temperature. Uh, this X uh, is the number of manganese uh, in our system. Okay, um, this is uh, the first paper uh, appeared in 2000 that predicted a number of uh, uh, transition temperature of a number of compounds. And uh, we, we argued, or Professor Dito argued uh, in particular, that uh, like other uh, thermodynamic properties, uh, this free energy is expected to be of carriers, particularly expected to be weakly perturbed by static disorder. But still, uh, disorder is a main thing, uh, is a very important thing to take into account. Although the model that I have described do, does not uh, take into account uh, the fact that we have disorder. Uh, we, in many aspects of uh, experiments, we have to take into account the disorder in order to understand uh, the, the, the property of the material. Okay. Um, uh, for example, this is an example recently appeared in Science, uh, done by a very nice work uh, in uh, Ali Yazdani's group in Princeton. They have shown, uh, using gallium manganese arsenide as an example, that there is uh, critical correlations uh, in, uh, can, or, or critical correlation can be visualized uh, near the metal insulator transition in, in this material. So this is very natural because we have an alloy with uh, of gallium arsenide with manganese. So there has to be some disorder, and uh, uh, many experiments indicate uh, many experiments indicate that we are uh, our material or gallium manganese arsenide uh, is very close to the metal insulator transition uh, boundary. Either side can be prepared. So, um, but for the moment. Uh, uh, or let's say for, for the entire, uh, for the rest of my talk, I will uh, uh, partially forget about this uh, disorder and uh, discuss about uh, the model or use the model to describe the uh, properties of gallium manganese arsenide. Okay, so this is an example of carrier concentration versus transition temperature calculated using the model uh, co and compared with the experimental results. And as you can see, uh, the model, at least for these three compounds that we have chosen, uh, give you uh, a reasonable account of what we see in the experiment. Okay. Uh, we can also, uh, let's, let's skip this part because of the shortage of time. So now uh, we, we have the material. We made gallium arsenide ferromagnetic. We increased our understanding, we have a model for our ferromagnetism. So what we can do with this uh, uh, new, uh, well, it's not uh, new anymore, but uh, when we were working on it, uh, it was new. And uh, what, what can we do with this new possibilities uh, or new material? One is that it can be epitaxially grown with semiconductor heterostructures. So uh, this is an example of what we have done, taking advantage of this fact. Uh, this is a, a device, epitaxially grown, and the band structure is shown here, and our gallium manganese arsenide uh, sits on the, on, on the very top. This we used to uh, monitor or, or do a spin uh, spectroscopy of the bandage of gallium manganese arsenide. Uh, the idea, I, I will not go into the details uh, of uh, the experiment, but, uh, but just to let, tell you the idea uh, is, this is uh, uh, the band structure of the device that we fabricated. 
So we have uh, an LED structure here. This is N-type, this is P-type, and by uh, biasing it, we can see light coming out from this LED part. And this LED part is, no, uh, is nothing to do with gallium magnesium arsenide. We have P-type gallium, ar uh, P -type gallium arsenide, N-type gallium arsenide. And here we have uh, heavily doped gallium arsenide, N-type, and uh, right next to it, uh, gallium magnesium arsenide, which is also heavily doped. So we naturally form here uh, an Esaki diode, tunneling junction, and by keeping this bias of this Esaki diode part constant, and we apply change voltage here uh, to push, move this, this part up and down. And the result is shown here. We have, we see uh, first of all, luminescence coming out from uh, uh, this LED, and luminescence it has circular polarization. And by analyzing the, the circular polarization, we have shown that at the very top of this valence band, when we extract electrons from this top of the valence band, we do have very high polarization. Uh, electroluminescence polarization is 30%, which corresponds to more than 85% of uh, spin polarization. And uh, if we are, when we apply uh, more uh, voltage, we see a sudden drop uh, because of, uh, because the spin polarization reduces as you go down, uh, as you probe more and more of the valence band. So this is an advantage that you, you, you can use. Uh, combining ferromagnetic material with a, with a, a, a semiconductor heterostructure to do a spectroscopy of semiconductor uh, ferromagnetic material. Another example, I will give you three examples. This is a second example. Another example is a domain wall motion. Domain wall is, a, uh, is formed between two domains of ferromagnets. Uh, here, as you can see, uh, one, one domain has, uh, has uh, uh, magnetization pointing upwards. Uh, the other domain has uh, magnetization pointing downward. And in between, there is a transition layer, and that, that layer is called domain wall. And in, in gallium magnesium arsenide, you can calculate uh, the width of this domain wall uh, using, again, Professor Dieter's calculations. And uh, uh, it turns out that it's uh, of the order of 20, 10 to 20 nanometers. And we have visualized this domain wall, uh, this is the boundary between black and grayish part. Uh, 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 we, we haven't been able to visualize domain wall, but the position of domain wall has to be here. And this domain wall uh, gives you a, a, a number of physics, uh, like spin transfer physics that uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Yuasa discussed about. And uh, as a result, you can drive current through, let's say, for example, this wire part. We have gallium magnesium arsenide here, and we have domain wall here. And uh, we pass current through this domain wall, and uh, we can observe the domain wall uh, motion. I will not go into the details of this domain wall motion, but the result is shown here. So this is a current, spin polarized current passing through the, the domain wall. And this is the velocity of the domain wall at various temperatures. And this part can be explained by spin transfer torque. Um, and that has also been observed in metallic structures. But the part that has not been fully observed in metallic structure is, is shown here. Here, if you expand it, we see creep motion. Uh, so this is which means that very, with very small current, we see very slow motion of domain walls. And the physics here is very different from the physic, uh, uh, spin transfer physics here. Because uh, we have a, a potential landscape, which is dominate, dominated by this randomness, for example. And we have a domain wall running through this random potential. And in order 
uh, and there will be a collective uh, phenomena showing up when you try to first uh, move this domain wall. A and uh, that's the physics that is completely different from uh, the physics that is shown uh, up here. So when you, when you do the measurement carefully around here, you see that uh, your, your, your velocity is exponentially dependent on the current density because of this uh, collective uh, phenomena. And that the, the same collective phenomena has been observed you, in metallic structures using a uh, magnetic field. And uh, this group has shown that uh, the velocity dependence of uh, the magnet uh, dependent on magnetic field can be written uh, in, in this form with critical exponent here uh, which we indicate as mu. So we assume that uh, although in, in, in their experiment they use magnetic field but we are using uh, current to uh, drive this creep motion, the gradual motion of, uh, of a domain wall. And we have found that uh, this critical exponent here is 0.33 and as you can see we can collapse all the seemingly different curves into uh, a set of curves that have, have uh, the same sort of slope. So it's clearly uh, we can use this uh, formula to scale uh, the, the, the physics that we are seeing uh, in our domain walls. Using the same device we, all, we can also do this very similar experiment using magnetic field. So this is current, but we, we can also apply magnetic field and induce creep motion. And, and this is what uh, the result. Uh, we have applied magnetic field, and uh, this is the velocity. And again, uh, the velocity is exponentially dependent uh, on magnetic field. And again, we use this uh, form to identify the critical exponent characterizing the physics here. And we have found that the critical exponent is 1.2. So uh, to our surprise, uh, these two exponents were different. So here we have uh, used the same gallium magnets arsenide, and we have used current to move the, to induce uh, uh, creep motion of the domain wall. We also used uh, magnetic field to induce the creep motion of uh, the domain wall. And in current driven case, uh, the critical exponent was 0.33. And field driven case, the critical exponent was 1.2. And this has been observed in, actually in uh, uh, ferroelectric materials and not in ferro ferromagnetic metals uh, and is known to be uh, not known to belong to a, random, uh, a universality class called random field. And here this part has not been previously known. So uh, by using our gallium magnets arsenide uh, we, have pro we have probed into a new physics uh, current driven creep motion uh, in, 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 in ferromagnets. And this part actually is very difficult to probe by uh, metal structures, metal ferromagnets, but uh, a, a few papers uh, started to appear. Uh, for example, uh, this week in, in Physical Review Letters reporting uh, the, the critical exponent seen in, in metallic structures. So it's interesting to see whether the, uh, in metallic structures too, uh, they see uh, this drastic difference between the two uh, exponents. Okay, so this is uh, the summary of, of what I have uh, discussed. So in, in semiconductors, we have been able to probe this part, which is current-driven uh, creep motion of the main wall. Uh, in metals, uh, it remains to be seen, but the papers uh, have uh, started to appear. Okay, so the, the last topic uh, is the electric field control of ferromagnetism. 
this actually is the subject of my talk uh, later uh, this week. Uh, so this will be the introduction of uh, the talk that I will be given on, uh, on Wednesday. I, I will be given uh, on Wednesday. So now uh, we know that this ferromagnetism in uh, three, five ferromagnetic semiconductors is stabilized by the presence of carriers. So if we can control the number of carriers, we should be able to control the stability of the ferromagnetic phase. And, uh, and to prove that this is indeed the case, we have made a, 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 an MIS structure, metal insulator semiconductor structure. And by applying voltage across this metal uh, MIS structure, we, we change hole concentration in indium magnesium arsenide and uh, prove whether we can see any change in, in magnetism. Uh, magnetization is probed by the hole voltage using the fact that the hole, hole voltage is dominated by the anomalous hole term. So this is an example uh, at temperature slightly below transition temperature uh, at zero gate bias, we see a very soft hysteresis uh, showing that uh, it's, it, the material is at the edge of uh, the transition temperature, slightly below. But if you apply positive voltage, this, is, this corresponds to uh, 1.5 megavolt per centimeter. Depleting holes, we see uh, completely, uh, we can completely uh, destabilize the ferromagnetic phase at this uh, temperature. And if you go increase the whole concentration by applying negative uh, voltage, we can see that our hysteresis is, is more becoming square-like. And if you go back to zero volt, you see that, uh, that, that you can get uh, virtually identical hysteresis curve that you started with. Uh, you, you can also analyze the whole data, uh, these data. Uh, uh, to determine uh, the spontaneous magnetization or the quantity that is proportional to spontaneous magnetization measured by the Hall effect. So this is a spontaneous magnetization or uh, temperature dependence of the sp spontaneous magnetization. And by definition, when the spontaneous magnetization becomes zero, that's your transition temperature, ferromagnetic transition temperature. So clearly, you can change uh, the ferromagnetic transition temperature by uh, 2 Kelvin, in this case, by applying electric field. Uh, so in this temperature range, you can turn on and off uh, ferromagnetic phase. Uh, this was done in indium magnesium arsenide. Uh, this was done in indium, oh, sorry, this was done in indium magnesium arsenide. We can also do the same thing in gallium magnesium arsenide, although it took us uh, some time to develop the technology. So basically, this is the same thing, uh, gallium, but instead of indium magnesium arsenide, we have gallium magnesium arsenide. And we apply an electric field to change the transition temperature. This is, again, spontaneous magnetization, or sp measured by the Hall effect. And this is a comparison between hole concentration. We know the capacitance. We know the change in the uh, conductivity. So we can uh, separate the, the uh, carrier concentration and mobility, uh, from which we can determine the total carrier concentration in the film. And, that, and divided by the film thickness, we can get this number, a whole concentration in cubic centimeters. And this is uh, the model calculation, PD Zeno model. Uh, and as you can see, it also accounts for uh, the magnitude of transition temperature. But if you examine this uh, small, tiny slide carefully, you may also notice that the slope Slopes are different between experiment and, uh, and uh, calculation or model calculation. And that will be explained uh, later 
in this in this week, uh, in in Wednesday in my talk. So uh, basically, uh, what we have done uh, is that uh, we explored we we have synthesized a new material. We made gallium arsenide ferromagnetic, and we tried to understand uh, the ferromagnetism we see in this in the material. First of all, we wanted to see where manganese is uh, in the lattice. And we also uh, noticed that there are a considerable number of interstitial manganese as well, which we can remove by low temperature annealing after growth. I didn't discuss about strain-dependent magnetic anisotropy for the interest of time. And uh, magnetism is clearly linked to transport properties because we can measure magnetization by, a, by the whole effect. And we, we also have developed a PD Zener model that des describe many aspects of experiments we see in the system. And uh, related to this PD Zener model, uh, Dr. Professor Sato, uh, the chairman of this chairperson of this uh, session, will discuss about first principle calculations of uh, diluted magnetic semiconductors. So. Uh, what are the, the range that PD Zeno model can be applied safely. And Professor Dietl in the afternoon will discuss, I think, about the PD part of the Zeno model. I have shown you three examples. Using this, uh, by using this uh, ferromagnetic semiconductor, we have explored a number of uh, new dimensions of magnetism, uh, but I have uh, shown three examples. One is that by, by you taking advantage of the fact that we can grow gallium magnesium arsenide uh, epitaxially on top of uh, uh, non-magnetic heterostructures, we can use it, for example, to do spin polarization spectroscopy, energy resolved. Or we can explore uh, domain wall creep motion. Uh, and because of the low magnetization, uh, we, have, we have been able to see uh, spin current induced domain wall creep and found that it, it, has, uh, it belongs to a, a very different universality class of uh, domain wall creep motion. I have also discussed about electric field control of magnetism and uh, understanding electric field control of magnetism in this material is of course very important and it, will, it, it, gives, it has given us a, a, a number of insights and the important thing is that now this electric field control of magnetism is extended to uh, metal ferromagnets. And part of the work or, 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 or significant progress has been made uh, at Osaka University uh, on this electric field control of ferro uh, ferromagnetic metals. Uh, I have to, uh, I would like to note. So thank you very much for your attention.